Hi, my name is Roy Rumbo. I'm an accounting professor at the University of North Texas, and I teach Intermediate Accounting 1 and 2. Today's lecture is for my Intermediate Accounting 2 students, and we're going to be talking about uh, share-based compensation. Uh, this is a compensation that mostly executives receive, so uh, you might not understand this. It is basically salary expense, and instead of crediting um, a salaries payable, uh, this is coming out of equity, so we're going to credit an, an equity account. So I want to look at that with you here today. I'm using the McGraw-Hill uh, materials from the um, Spiceland, Nelson & Thomas Intermediate Accounting Textbook. Great book. I always <laughs> say that, but it is a really good book. So uh, let's get started here. So uh, I'm going to start this whole discussion with an overview of, uh, you know, and I, you know, people probably get just sick of hearing about Lennox, where I worked as the chief accounting officer for 11 years. However, I do know Lennox, I do understand it, I know what kind of a compensation we received, I know the backstory, I know everything. So it's always easier to share a real story. And if you're sick of Lennox, you can go look at someone else's uh, uh, materials uh, around. Um, share-based compensation, you know, look at another companies are all available in, in proxies. So, so I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna just, you know, because you may not know there's, th there's multitude of different types of share-based compensation. And there's three primary ones, which the book talks about. And at Linux, we received as executives, I was one of them. We received uh, all three of these at the same time. Uh, we were granted these every December, 15th, and they were three-year grants, if you will. So let's take a look at uh, what they were. And so, um, so this is exactly what Linux received. I'm using some some funny numbers here, if you will. Uh, but uh, my, by the way, the uh, CEO's personal compensation was a, probably about a 20% on annual salary and about maybe 10 or 20% an annual bonus, cash bonus, and 60 to 70% of it was share-based compensation. And so, uh, you know, that can be really valuable if we grant someone shares uh, on December 15th of one year, and it's good for three years. If that share price doubles or triples, which happened at Linux, then that compensation also doubles and triples. And so that's why you see these really big, uh, compensation salaries quoted for some of the CEOs or CFOs or you know C-level executives um, because of the doubling, tripling of the stock price. Well, you think shareholders are upset that the share that the CEO is making too much money? Well, no, because if the shares are doubling and tripling, they're winning big. And so, uh, share-based compensation one of the number one things it does it aligns management with the shareholder. If the shareholder wants the stock price to grow and they're willing and happy to pay the executives when the share price grows. And so think about that. Again, it's variable compensation because if the share price declines, by the way, which happened when I was at Maytag Corporation, we're having some hard years there at the end of my career there, and that compensation becomes zero. <laughs> you know, It's not even worth a cup of coffee, if you will. So it all this 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 is a you know big time compensation with just a high look, high potential of big money if you will, but also it is also carries risk for the executive. So it's just like owning the stock in the company, and that's what shareholders want. So now the book textbook slides are going to go through this uh, materials and explain it, but I think if I make it more real to you of what you know uh, an executive. By the way, when I say executive, it was director level and above. So a lot of my direct reports also received uh, these uh, share-based grants, and so uh, it wasn't. So it's a you know broader uh, um, participation than you might think, like five executives getting all this. It was much broader than that. Um, and so again, we wanted our employees who worked for us, our directors who could influence results, to be aligned with us and aligned with the shareholders you know, to grow the stock price. So if you have to make a tough decision, 
you're on board with it because it's a decision that's a tough decision, but it's good for the shareholder. It's good for the stock price, good for the long-term uh, growth of the company. And uh, that's another point I'd make here that these are three-year grants. And so it can't be just go out and get the short-term victory, short-term results by cutting all the costs and not worrying about the future years. No, there's a three-year grants. And we had a rolling three-year grant. So enough said about that. Here's the type of grants that we received at Lenox. And as, as you hear about this, I want you to think about how would you account for this? This is very controversial share-based compensation expense. And when the FASB first tried to pass one, even Congress got involved and said no, because of all the uh, lobbying by the, the high tech firms that, that paid a lot of people stock options. But a lot of people said, we don't need share-based compensation expense because it's not paid in cash, it's paid in share. So there's no impact. You know, There's never a cash payment. It's always share payments out of equity. But you know, I disagree with that. I believe this is real. And, you know, and these are real costs for the corporation when they're divvying out uh, equity to uh, their executives and uh, high level employees. So three types, uh, stock options, restricted stock and performance uh, stock plans. And so I want to talk about what these are before you just get into the slides and get the textbook version of it, if you will. I'd rather come at this with a very real world example. And this is definitely the real world, what we received. Now, um, part of this is something I could, I could have pulled up an old personal grant I received. I decided not to do that. Um, you know, that, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the data is. So this is, you know, probably close to a real world example uh, going back. So assume there was a hundred dollar stock price, the stock price, was on the date of the grant. And for us, that was around December 15th, right after a board meeting. The board has to approve these and authorize these and grant these. On December 15th, that stock price was $100. And in, in accounting, we're gonna care about that because we're gonna have to understand what is the fair value of these three uh, stock plans that we're giving to executives. We're going to expense the fair value of that. Keep in mind, that's one of the, biggest principles of this whole chapter around share-based compensation, the compensation expense is gonna be equal to the fair value granted. Now, guess what I said? This is a three-year grant, you know? Uh, and so we'll have to divide that expense into each year. So that's another challenge. By the way, you have to stay there for three years. So, yeah, being an executive is high risk. Not everyone will stay there. So we're going to have to kind of estimate how many people will leave or, you know, you can leave voluntarily, you know, which happens, or you could get fired. In either case, you lose the grant, 100%. You don't get anything. And so in accounting, we got to figure that out. So we got, you know, a fair value. We've got the term, how long this is. These are all three-year grants. And we've got to understand, you know, how many people might lose these. So again, my purpose here is what, let's go through here. What is a stock option? Well, this is how it worked at Lenox and how it works for every company that I'm aware of. In fact, if you don't do it this way, uh, it will not work for share-based compensation expense. It would have you know, adverse accounting you know, for this. And so nobody wants to do that. So uh, 10,000 options uh, to buy the stock at $100, same as the grant date price. And three-year vesting period. What does that mean, vesting? That you, Mr. Executive, have the option to buy the shares of stock at $100, but not until after you've worked for us for three years. Now, guess what? The options are exercisable for seven years. So there's seven-year options. So first three years, you cannot, um, you cannot exercise these options but you can exercise in four, five, six, seven. So that's a lot of the time for the share price to grow. Well, let's think about, this is another term for you. What is the intrinsic value of the stock? Not the fair market value, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, what is the intrinsic value? Well, if I can go, you know, exercise price of 100 means that in year four, after I'm vested, I can buy the stock for $100. 
I don't have to, it's an option. What if the stock is 75? Would I buy the stock at 100? Maybe if I'm insane, <laughs> you know, because I buy it at 100 and I could have bought it in the open market for 75. So if I buy it at 100 and sell it, I lose $25 times 10,000, you know, that's a, that's a lot of money. However, let's go the other way. What if the stock goes to 200? What's the intrinsic value? Well, 200 minus 100. The intrinsic value would be $100. What if it was 150? The stock price was 150. 150 minus 100. The intrinsic value of that option is $50. Well, let's just think about that. Let's say it goes to 200. And I'm in year four, I've got 10,000 options. I go out and buy 10,000 shares of stock. And I think that's going to be, that would cost a million dollars. But guess what? They're worth 2 million. <laughs> you know, see, I told you, share based compensation can be really big money. And so uh, in the end of year four, I buy them at an option price of 100 and I go out and immediately sell them at 200. Big, big win for the employee. How about the shareholder? Yeah, they doubled their money. It went from 100 to 200. So that's how stock options work. Now, again, I told you, uh, we're going to really care about the fair market value. We're going to expense the fair market value. And this is one of the points of this chapter. We're going to expense um, the fair market value and the date of grant. Now, the fair market value of that option is going to change after the date of grant, after December 15th. We ignore that. We just take the fair market value and the date of grant, and then we use that to calculate expense. Now, you'd have to, you know, uh, be a finance uh, professor, or you know, maybe some of you are finance um, majors, and you could figure this out for me. Uh, but there is a value day one. Now, the intrinsic value is zero of the date of grant, because I could buy it for 100 and sell it for 100. No value. But if it's a highly volatile stock, maybe sometimes it's 200, maybe sometimes it's 50, that gives value to that option. Now, is it worth 100? No. There's a formula. Uh, the Black-Scholes model is one way of doing it. There's a lattice model. There's different ways to value this, some better than others. But you know, I think a lot of companies use the Black-Scholes model, and it gets into um, in interest rates and um, dividends and volatility of the stock, all of that to value this. But you know, guess what? When I was chief accounting officer at Linux, we hired uh, Price Waterhouse. Now, Price Waterhouse uh, was not our auditors; KPMG was our auditors, but Price was another big four firm, and they would come in and they would calculate the value of the options we granted on December 15th. And they gave us a nice little package. We could give it to our auditor and say, here's the value of the options. You know, another big four firm, <laughs> kind of hard to challenge. And so now, and this, this is an even better textbook. We will give you the fair value of the option. Thank God you're not gonna have to calculate that. So the fair value of these options was $10. So what was the value of this individual grant? It would be $10 times 10,000, um, $100,000. So that was the value on that day. Now, as I said, it could be worth a million later if that stock goes to 200, but we ignore all that. We keep, or it could go to zero. If stock is below, if the price drops below 100, then the value of those options is zero for the executive. However, we keep that $10, point one of this chapter. So that's what a stock option is. Again, three-year vesting. All of these are gonna have vesting creeps, all of these grants. But this one is different because um, it's open. It's good for seven years. So four more years after the vesting period. So this one is interesting. The point being, uh, the value of that is $10 per option, even though the stock price is 100. Second grant, restricted stock. This is just a pure, unadulterated gift of shares of stock. 5,000 shares of stock, but it is restricted. Now, sometimes uh, there are actual shares of stock given with a restriction on them that you cannot sell them. And in other times, which is mostly the case, 100% the case at Lenox, you got restricted stock units, RSUs. And it was just, it was 
it turned into a stock in the domestic bait. It was an RSU. So you didn't have to deal with all the legal um, aspects of that. RSUs and a pure grant of real restricted stock, the counting doesn't change for that. Now, here's how this works. 5,000 shares, they're restricted. But at the end of the vesting period, which for Linux was three years, might be different for different companies, um, the restrictions moved. And on that last day of the end of the third year, as long as you're employed by the company, boom, you get those shares of stock. They just drop into your brokerage account. Happy days, happy days. Now, even if the stock in this case goes down to 75, you still get 5,000 shares in this grant times 75. So you don't have as much risk with stock options and you don't get as, as large of a grant. Now, again, stock price goes to 200. It's still a big win because now 5,000 times 200, you know, when that um, grant is removed. And then you own the shares, you get dividends, you get you can sell them or you could just keep them if you want. So now the fair value on these is going to just be equal to the, the price of the stock on the grant date. That's easy. You know, that makes sense, right? Because I'm giving you 5,000 shares of stock that's valued at $100 on December 15th. What's the value of that? 5,000 shares times $100, right? Now, it could go up or down in the future, but we ignore all that. In share-based compensation, we focus on the date of the grant, the fair market value of that date. We never change it. That's, I'm going to drill that into your head, but we look at the slides too. And then the final one, which will be towards the end of this chapter here, uh, there's 5,000 shares of granted, and shares are granted, uh, you know, based, and they will be granted at the end of the vesting period for Linux was three years again, but it was also based on some performance conditions. And if uh, number one condition for these two is the same thing, you got to be still employed because if the executive employment terminated, you lose it. If the performance conditions are not met, you lose it. Now at Linux, uh, and I believe correctly, we had two, uh, two performance conditions. One was return on invested capital. That would make sense. So none of these are based on stock price. These are actually performance of the company. So if, uh, if you met ROIC, I can't remember the other one, might have been growth in uh, net income or something. Regardless, there's some financial metrics that, that we had to meet. Now, here's what's interesting uh, for Linux, and I think for a lot of companies, there was a, a, ra a ratio for these. And so it could be from 0% to 200%. So think about that for a minute. You know, so these could double, and it could be 10,000 shares if we, if we blew out and met all the, the performance conditions. Now, performance conditions were not easy. They were, they were, there were high targets for these, high hurdles. And many times we met it. So what if the stock price double? So that's times 200%. And then that times another 200%, you could end up with 400% uh, value more than what the company expected when they granted these to you. And fortunately that happened at Linux. We were very, very high performing company. In fact, uh, when I joined the company, stock was trading at 20. When I left, it was around 250. Uh, it was up to 350 last year. So this is a very, very high performing company. We had a, a great CEO, uh, Top Blue going. And so, you know, you know, that's anyway, that tells you you want to be with a high performing company. You want to look at the financial statements before you want to understand the leadership and the culture, and not just a fun, loving culture. You want to be in a results oriented culture as well. And that that meant a lot to me being a results oriented culture. So again, now we're gonna to have to deal with two things in these from accounting. The fair market value of the data grant, that doesn't change. And that's gonna be 5,000 uh, times 100 if we think we can meet these performance conditions. At Linux, we usually started out, we believe we were gonna meet this at 100%. And then uh, as you move into year two, year three of this grant, the fair market value doesn't change, but we've got to evaluate these performance conditions? What's the probability of meeting these or not meeting these? So along the way, sometimes we see, man, we in year two, year one, I always kept it 100% because I don't know what's going to happen in the next two years. But in year two and year three, you start to see, hey, we're going we're gonna to blow this out. This is going to be a 200%. So you need, if that's probable in this card, you would, you would double up the expense and you would true that up. 
Um, but the fair market value would not change, only that kicker for performance. So with that, I think, I hope this helps. You know, again, you can see the textbook slides. Some will be repeating myself, unfortunately, but I think it's good to get an overview, um, you know, that's, I always love the movie, based on a true story. This is, you know, based on the true story. This is what uh, the grants were at Lenox. And uh, I hope you end up with, as an executive with the company and you're getting these. And then guess what you can do? You can retire at 62, like me, and go teach school, which is a lot more, <laughs> doing a lot more for the world, I'm sure, teaching school than, um, than being a chief accountant officer. You know, I did think about trying to make sure uh, I thought it was, you know, that I was doing something good in, you know, at Lenox. I don't know if it's as good as teaching and helping uh, young people succeed. You know, I would have to admit that. Um, so now we're going to go from the based on a true story to the boring uh, lecture slides. So let's just uh, drive through these. But hopefully uh, you have some base level of knowledge here um, from what these are. And it might be more interesting to look at uh, what people really received uh, than just seeing this. Uh, these are all hypothetical here. All right, there we go. Okay, so uh, share-based awards are payments. Yep, it's tied to the market price of this company stock. And there's uh, stock awards, stock option, stock appreciation rights. And sometimes there's a performance incentive. We've talked about that. And here's the accounting agenda. Here's the most important thing on this slide. Determine the fair value of the compensation on the date of grant. I'll add those words there. And to expense that compensation over the periods in which performance perform their services. Well, if the vesting period is three years, meaning I've got to stay there and I've got to work for all three years, then we're going to spread, we're going to expense that compensation over that vesting period. Each year we'll get one third, one third, one third of what we consider to be that compensation. Again, based on the fair value at the date of grant. We're gonna start here. Uh, you know, I started with stock options because I think they're pretty interesting, but we're gonna start with the easy one here in these slides, restricted stock plans. And two types, uh, actual stock that has a restriction on it and then restricted stock units, RSUs. They're, you know, the accounting doesn't change. I don't want you to get caught up in these two different types, but it's, you know, you might, it's more, I think there's more legal and treasury issues here than accounting issues. And so they're awarded in the name of the company, um, their shares, but especially if they're real shares, the, the company's gonna maintain, maintain possession. You're not gonna get dividends. You're not gonna be able to vote those, nothing. And uh, guess what? Subject forfeiture uh, by the employee if employment is terminated. Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you lose them. You, you know, if you get fired, you don't get any of these, they're gone. And that's really, and there is no like, well, maybe, no, there's no exception to this. Otherwise there would be some, some legal issues. And so only after the shares vest, after the end of the vesting period, then the restrictions are lifted. And then um, the restricted talk is replaced by common stock. And now that stock is like any other stock held by any other shareholder. So we're gonna go have to, guess what? Go after it, got there in our accounting entry and in credit common stock and make sure the number of units out issued uh, times the par value is, is good because now it's an issuance of stock. Um, market prices changes might occur. No, no, they will occur. The stock price is going to change, but that will not affect total compensation. We stick to the day one. So RSU is right receive a number of shares of company stock. I got restricted stock at Maytag. I got restricted type units at Lenox. I could have cared less. They're not, they're not my shares until the vesting date. What I cared about was on the vesting date, I wanted to see my common stock in my brokerage account. And, you know, magically it, uh, it showed up there and it was great. Let's see if I missed anything here. could be given cash. Yeah, I, I just want to think about that. It's much safer, 
you know, to meet the rules if you give employee stock. So here's an example. And um, by the way, you're going to see the math and everything is easy. That's why I spent some time on trying to understand what these are. The hardest part of this chapter is like you've never worked in a business, never received a stock option. That's going to be harder to understand. So that's why I started with my example up front. The accounting, once you understand this, it's pretty easy to get the logic down. So here, uh, universal grants, RSUs, representing uh, five million, five million um, of its $1 par common shares to key executives. Um, and the shares uh, and uh, shares are forfeited if the employee money is terminated for you. So the vesting period is four years here. The shares are valued at $12 on January 1. That's important, date of grant. And so uh, there's no entry on January 1. Why is that? Nobody's worked, you know, just get this grant. And if you're fortunate enough to stay here for four years, by the way, high percentage of executives are fired. There's restructurings, you know, it's high reward, but high risk. So many of these you know, will not make it to the four years. That's a long time for an executive life. So, um, so there's no entry because no work has been done. But we will go, what's the total value that's been provided? Five million shares times $12 per share. So the total value given to these executives on January 1 was 60 million. But guess what? We've got to allocate that to each of the four years. And so we allocate it over the four year service life, 60 million divided by four. So we're gonna do an expense of 15 million a year. It's, we've done debit salary expense, credit salaries payable, right? That's what we've done. Okay, when debit salaries expense, but we're not gonna pay cash. We're gonna give it out of equity. So guess what we do? Um, back here. Uh, for the four years, each year, December 31st, we're gonna make this entry. Debit salary expense or compensation expense for 15 million, you know, four times. So we'll, this will be 60 in total at the end of four years. And uh, we're going to pull it out of paid in capital and we'll put it, we'll keep a separate account for that so we can track this. We will need to, if, you know, for things that might happen in the future. And so paid in capital is be a separate account, but on the balance sheet, it'll just show up in additional paid in capital. You only you have one line item on the balance sheet. It'll be a credit of 15. So, you know, uh, debit expense and credit uh, restricted stock. Now, what's happened? I, you know, this one thing. What's happened to equity here? I've increased equity here, but guess what? I've decreased equity. So, really, during the four years, there's no uh, change in, in equity. All right. Then, uh, on December 31st, 2021, hallelujah for the executives. And it looks like none of them were let go. Yeah, that's a yeah, miracle. <laughs> you know, doesn't happen. So, at that point, we're going to pull this out. You know, we've done four entries and we've every year put 15 million in paid in capital restricted stock. So right now, the end on December 31st, 2021, we've got 60 million sitting there and we're going to pull it out and we're going to debit that for 60 million. Why? Now, uh, I forgot how many shares, 5 million shares. Well, I can see that right here. Uh, 5 million shares have now been issued. This should look very similar to you. This is just like receiving cash and issuing common stock. I got to credit my common stock account for these 5 million new shares because the common stock account's got to stay pure. It's always number of shares issued times the par value. Par value is $1. So 5 million times $1, I'm going to credit that for 5 million. I'm going to debit this and take it to zero. And now I'm going to credit my, my normal paid in capital excessive power account. So this looks just like an issuance of shares. And that makes sense because this is an issuance of shares. These executives now own these shares. They can vote them. They will receive dividends. They can sell them. They can do anything like a normal shareholder. All right, next, stock option plans. Hopefully you already have a feel for this from the beginning of this lecture. It's a number of shares of stock at a specified exercise price. Then the exercise price, what you can buy them for in, uh, during a specific time. 
Now I talked about intrinsic value um, equals the market share of the price minus the option price. I wouldn't worry about this historical, doesn't matter. So the market price of the shares minus the option price, as I said, if I got a stock option of 100 and I can, and the stock price is selling at 150, I can buy that stock for 100 and I can sell it uh, for 150. If I knew where my phone is, I would turn that thing off, uh, but I'll just let it go for now. It's making a noise around here somewhere, <laughs> but that's okay. We'll let it go. Hopefully I don't get any uh, phone calls here, I'm getting some text here. So the intrinsic value is just, you know, like I said, I, I can buy my exercise price 100, good. I'll buy that 100 because I can sell it for 150. That's easy math, that makes sense, right? If I can sell it for 150 and I have the option to buy the 100, the value is 50 bucks. So that's the intrinsic value. Um, and so here's one, um, you know, if, it, if it, an option is appointed by a share of stock with a market price of 25, uh, if he could buy it for 10, intrinsic value is 15. That makes sense. However, we do not, the, the intrinsic value of data grant is always going to be zero. And we're going to grant it on the day of grant at the price. But uh, there is a, a way in finance theory to the options have value. Real, that, that value we're trying to come up with here, guesstimate, real value. And you can go out and buy options to purchase stock and, and they sell and I have purchased them. You know, you, they, you can get that from Yahoo or Google Finance. You can see the option prices for all stocks. And usually they may have two, three year term uh, to buy it. You know, and and uh, there's a value there. How is the value? You could use an option pricing model. What matters? What are the variables that come into play? The exercise price of the option, uh, expected term of the option. If this option has a seven year life, it's gonna be more valuable than an option has a five year life. So there's more of a greater chance for that stock to jump up uh, higher than the option price. Um, you know, current market price of the stock versus the exercise price, uh, that's gonna matter. And then expected dividends uh, will come into play here and expected risk-free rate of return during the term, these both play in. But the biggest uh, things that, that determine the value of the option for us, expected volatility of the stock. If that stock goes up and down a lot, there's a greater chance it's gonna go up. So a more volatile stock is gonna up is going to have a higher value for the options to purchase that stock. So the two pieces here for us that really matter, all matter, you know, again, people, this will be given to you, but you should understand this uh, for example, if it says uh, higher volatility equals higher value, longer term also equals, equals higher value. And I think that makes sense. So here is um, a stock option example. And uh, the Universal Corporation has grants options um, to acquire 10 million of the common shares within the next eight years, but not before December 31st, 2021. So that's 2018, 2019, 2020. So again, this vesting period is again, like the restricted stock, I mean, four years. And so, um, you know, they cannot exercise this. Uh, an exercise price is the same as the market price, $35 per share. So the intrinsic value on day one is zero. By the way, if it's not, there's a different accounting and I'll let you, that's beyond the scope of this course, but because that accounting is adverse uh, to companies, uh, they never do it. And so generally always the exercise price is gonna be the same as the market price on the date of the grant. So the intrinsic value is zero, but there's a fair value and it's $8 per option. Well, we know how many options have been granted. We know the value per option. We'll get this from some kind of experts to help us with this. And so we take $8 times 10 million on day one, January one date of grant. We know we've given $80 million of fair value to our executives. But have they done anything yet? No, no entry on day one. We will record a, an expense each year that they work. And so just like, you know, we're, you know, they're working, providing benefit, they're moving closer and closer to being vested. And so we'll expense it 
as they move along. And so again, just like restricted stock, you know, the fair, fair market value never changes regardless of what happens to stock price. If we have this 80 million that we, that we calculate on day one, divided by four years, the expense will be 20 million per year. And by the way, uh, that compensation expense looks just like the last journal entry. Debit compensation expense each year for 20 million, credit paid in capital stock options. And so at the end of four years, how much is gonna be in this paid in capital stock options account? We do the same entry every year, four years, 80 million. And so we got 80 million at the end, um, uh, at the end, and I'm gonna skip by this, I'm gonna get back. I don't want you to see that slide yet, but, you know, so we'll, you know, debit compensation expense and credit now. Now, the next slide, I don't want you to see it yet. Uh, here's the issue. Fair, amount, fair market value, we're never touching that. We're gonna leave it at the, at the $8. And then the previous example, whatever that was, we're gonna leave that alone. However, um, we've got a problem here. At the end, everybody's not gonna be there. I, I, you know, if, if you're an executive with a company, uh, I got some bad news for you. You might be one of them. You know, everybody is not going to receive these grants. Why? They could get fired. You know, okay. I always told my staff, I'm just one bad journal entry away. You know, let's make sure these journal entries are right, you know, because I was the chief accounting officer. So, you know, that pressure to perform for four years. Now, you can also, you know, find a better job. Maybe instead of being corporate controller, I found a job as a CFO of another world. I would walk away from this. And that was actually kind of hard because I, I just stayed where I was because these became pretty valuable at, at Linux. But some people do walk away from them and go to a different company for a higher position and they want to grow their career. But again, that's another, by the way, another value uh, for the company of having um, a vesting period and valuable share base. They keep their executives. So high performing executive um, will at Linux would tend to stay at Linux, even in a in a lower role than they could have found outside uh, because they were they want to get to the end of the vesting. By the way, it wasn't just one grant. Every year there was a new grant. So you had always had these rolling. So at any point in time I had three years of grants that I was vested in. And so think about it that way. Again, point being here, we're gonna have what we call forfeitures. And we've got to account for that along the way. That becomes a, a, a bit of a curve here. And uh, we're gonna to have to estimate forfeitures. Now you have two ways of doing this as a company. You know, you can estimate it up front. We know in history, 5% of the people will not get these. And so therefore we're going to, book a lower expense right up front in the first year, and then we'll have to adjust it along the way. The second way that is allowed uh, by GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles, is I'm gonna start at 100% and I'll, I will take, uh, I will adjust my expense when the forfeitures happen. In Linux, we did use an estimate of forfeitures and we met every quarter with, uh, the VP of HR and head of compensation trying to understand what we thought was gonna be happening with these forfeitures. Um, we had a very high forfeiture rate when we had a new CEO and then he got all his new team in and we had a very low forfeiture rate because my fund, you know, last seven or eight years, very few people and, you know, very few people were leaving because they were pretty valuable. So in this company, they're going to book this, um, you know, um, as they go along. And so, they're expecting a 5% rate, but uh, in the third year, they realized hmm, too, too low, it's gonna be 10%. So we're gonna look at this, this third year is where the complexity happens, by the way. And so we'll have to think about that when we get there. But year one and year two, instead of, instead, you know, it was gonna be 80 divided by 420, we're gonna do 80 times, we don't think 100% of this is gonna be given out, times 95% divided by four. So the expense is less than 20 that we saw in the previous example, it's only 19. And so for two years, we're going along, 5% forfeiture looks good. So for both two years, uh, we're only booking 19 million in expense. 
However, year three, we're already told, gonna to jump to 10%. So we've got to figure that out. And here you go in year three. Now, this this is makes it a little more complicated uh, than, other than it should be, because this is appropriate accounting, I would say, but more complicated for you who have not seen this before. We're gonna say, hey, where should we be in total expense for three years, first of all. And then we're gonna subtract out what we've already expensed. And so we're gonna kind of true up to like cumulative expense, cum cumulative amounts that should be in here. So where should we be? It'd be 80% times 90%, uh, 72 million. And then three quarters of that, I, I don't have my calculator close by, uh, whatever that is, um, you know, to three quarters of 72, I almost could get there, right? 36, I think that would be 54 million. Yeah, so we should have expensed, 50, if we'd have known it was gonna be 10%, we would end booking 18 million a year or 18 times three, 54 million. Well, we were booking 19. So we take the 54 that we should be at in cumulative expense for three years, subtract the 19 and the 19 from years one and two, and we book 16 million expense. So now we're good because 19 plus 19, 38 plus 16 equals 54. And so we're trued up. This is good now and paid in capital in total, we're sitting there with 54. And then the last year, uh, the 10% turns out to be still good. And so now we have 80% times 90% times four fourths. 100%, right? And so now we're going to be at 72 million in the year four. That's where we should be cumulative. We subtract out what we have previously done, uh, you know, 54, if we have 18. So the hard part here is this year three is going to be a cumulative catch up, if you will, in expense. Now, here's the second way of doing it. We're just going to book them um, as they go. So we just start out. Hey, no forfeitures in year one, no forfeitures in year two. We still have that 80 million, um, you know, divided by four, 20 million. By the way, we still have the issue in year three, 10% uh, 10 of the people uh, leave in year three. Let me just make sure I got that right and looked at. Um, Then, so options with a fair, they don't tell us how many, they must tell us somewhere, uh, when granted, are forfeited due to executive turnover. It's gonna be the same as that previous example, you know, 10%. You know, um, yeah, there's the 10%. So we had 80 million in value minus eight, oh, options with a fair value of 8 million are forfeited. So that would be still the 10% of the 80 as in the previous. So the exactly the same fact pattern is what we just saw in the previous slide, but they tell us 8 million have been forfeited. So we do, again, same thing, exactly the same logic is in the previous um, example when they estimate revisions up front. We need to true up in that third year. Where should we be? 80 million minus eight, because the eight got forfeited. There's that 72 million times three, three fourths, three out of the four years. We should be at what? 54 million, just like in the last example. But we booked 20 and 20 because we were doing estimates as they incur. So 54 minus 20 minus 20, 14. 54 minus 40 is 14. So the compensation expense is lower, again, just truing up. And the last year, no, no forfeitures in the last year. And, you know, um, 72 million, 100%, 72 million minus what we booked before. 18 million. And so, you know, I don't know which is the better accounting. Uh, we had a really good process for estimating. And we we're really, really good at it. And we had a good team teamwork with HR that helped us. We had a great person there uh, that understood things. And uh, we just said, hey, let's stay. The rules changed where we had this option to take them as they incur. And so we got a good estimating process. Let's just keep going. So we didn't want to mess with that. I guess the good news here is you know, 
when you, this would match the year that they leave, uh, the other one matches maybe historical experience, if you will. So now, now when stock options are exercised, this is going to be different than the um, than what we saw with restricted stocks because we're going to get cash in first of all. They have to buy these shares. So in this case, have to. By the way, they can't do it in the vesting period. So this is happening after the vesting period, uh, January eleventh, two thousand twenty-four. Uh, this when these uh, 5 million shares are exercised, the market price of the stock is $50. Has no bearing on what we're going to record because they can sell it for 30, for 50, but they're going to give us 35 million, $35 per share. Why? That's the price. They are going to exercise these options. And so we're going to receive as a company $35 a share times 5 million. We're going to get cash of 175 million. Now, guess what? That five million shares are going to be worth uh, a lot more, you know, than 175 million. I guess that would be 250 million. So the intrinsic value at this point, 50 minus 35 is 15 dollars. So big windfall for the executives, but not for the company. We just get back to the you know the exercise price. How much cash do we receive? 175. If they sell that, they're going to sell it out in the open market to other shareholders, not back to the company. Um, so here's the accounting. We take our cash in. We pull out half of the 80 that we had put in there and paid in capital for stock options. You know, I guess this is without the forfeitures. So half of that. So we pull not all of it, half of it out because half of uh, half the shares, 5 million shares, were um, were. Um, exercise. So this, this part is different. This part is the same. Now we have a new 5 million shares in the open market issued and owned by shareholders, owned by, well, they are shareholders, but they're also executives of the company. They're going to be able to, um, you know, they're, they're shares now. So we got to get the common stock around, right? 5 million shares times the $1 par value, 5 million. And then this is just a plug. 215 in debits, uh, minus five, 210. And this goes in the normal, uh, traditional paid in capital account, excessive part or APIC, and comes out of the paid in capital that we've been setting aside for stock options. All right, guess what? Uh, half the shares uh, are exercised, half of them expire without being exercised. Now, if the stock price was 50, what's wrong with these executives? <laughs> they should be exercised. But maybe the stock price dropped below, but they expired, never got option, never got it, and they're, they're gone. You know, it's, this is one of the complaints about share-based compensation because that should be a win for the company now. These shares not, people work for us for four years. They never even got to use this, the share-based compensation. The, the, they, they expired. Well, that's not how it works. We just take it out of paid in capital for stock options, this remaining half that never got exercised and put it in paid in capital. Note, there is no credit to common stock because these options expired. They were never turned in to issued shares. All right, now we're moving to that third column that I was showing you. There could be a performance or market, market condition. So we, at Linux, as I said, we got stock options, we got restricted stock units, and we also got uh, performance uh, stock plans. And they weren't performance stock options, they were performance stock plans, we call them PSPs for short. And so they had a performance condition. And that was, you know, meeting uh, referred, uh, return on invested capital targets and financial targets as a company. And so it provides employees with an additional incentive, certainly did, I could I could attest to that. And the option still, uh, it might not be exercisable until performance targets met and uh, maybe a vesting. We have both a vesting and a performance target on that. And you have forfeit lows. So recognition of recognition of compensation with performance-based options depends on is it probable that performance target will be met? And ultimately, oh, did it get met? You know, right? But along the way, in that three-year vesting period, we have to kind of decide, is it probable we're going to pay out 
is that sometimes it was probable we're going to pay out 200 percent. I hate to say there were some bad times when it was probable this will not be paid out. And so there was no expense. And so you got to look at that from that side. So here's an example. Um, initial expectation is not probable. Uh, fair value, this was 10 million shares. Um, and then only if sales increased by 10% after four years. So the board uh, gave these options, hoping these guys are going to grow the um, revenues of the company. If they grow them by 10%, Man, look what they could get. Uh, 10 million shares times an $8 fair value. That would be 80 million total compensation. Right now, we think it's not probable initial, so we don't record any. Um, after three years, it turns out it is probable. And so um, now, you know, just like the other one, we're going to kind of true this up for the three out of the four years because there's still the vesting period. And so 80 times three divided by four equals 60. So we record 60. And then uh, they finally achieve it in the next, um, sorry about this. They finally achieve it and they get 20. By the way, if they didn't achieve it, uh, we would reverse the expense we did last year, minus 60 and, and, and debit us. And so that's also possible. So that, my friends, is share-based compensation. Those, uh, you get the three types of plans there. Uh, key, key principle is uh, calculate the fair market value of the data grant, expense it over the vesting period. Um, remember to account for estimated departures of executives and you true that up in whichever year uh, that uh, adjustment changes. So that's kind of it for share-based compensation. Now, um, in addition to share-based compensation, some companies allow employees to purchase shares, usually at a discount to the market. Uh, when I was with Maytag, I started out there as a senior auditor in the internal audit department. Um, we could purchase uh, shares at a 10% discount. And man, I did that. And, and that's the first time I realized the value of withdrawals from my paycheck because that started building over time. And I just, I never thought about it because I had my take-home pay. I lived off my take-home pay. And then I'd sometimes look at that, that uh, employee share purchase, but I said, wow, <laughs> there's, there's some real money here. Okay, forget about it. Put your blinders on, just let it keep riding, you know? And so that was good. Now, so we've got to account for that. Here's the problem why this, this plan got eliminated by Maytag, unfortunately, because uh, the accounting changes, there was no compensation expense for that. Um, back then for 10%. Well, now they changed the discount factor to 5%. If the discount factor is greater than 5%, you have to record compensation expense. Look how the accounting uh, rules changes, impacts corporations, because immediately they just canceled the plan. It's like, what? <laughs> Why don't we just do the 5%? Not how it works. And so if it's uh, less than 5%, there's really no accounting. They just get uh, shared. You know, it's just, they get a withdrawal from their paycheck, you know, they buy shares at 5% of the price, and then they're their shares, no issue for accounting. But if it's greater than 5%, uh, now we have, we have to record compensation expense for that 15%. So an employee buys, um, buy shares at uh, the market price is 1,000, they buy them for 850. And so we debit cash for 850, we credit common stock for 1,000, they own those shares, and there's that compensation expense of, of 150. Now back over here, if if they uh, if the company issued shares, I have to come back and say there would be, uh, you know, a, um, a common stock issue, a common stock. There would be a journal entry, but no compensation expense. Now a lot of times people have gotten buying from the open market, not from the company too. So, and and that's it because the next topic is going to be earnings per share. I do split this. Uh, chapter in half, 19.1 19, 19 and 19.2. Uh, and so uh, the next lecture on YouTube uh, will be 19.2, will be earnings per share. Otherwise, I think these just become uh, too long. And I think I have to, I separate my testing between these as well for my, some of my exams. So I'd like to split this, this chapter up. So with that, 
Uh, I thank you for hanging with me on chair-based compensation. Uh, yes, I, my, my conclusion is, I hope that you get some of these grants yourself and um, at least you'll know how to do the accounting for them in a large public company. And you know that's, that's a value. And, and that's why they pay people or CPAs who understand the complexities around these kind of things. So again, I just thank you for your attention. Uh, next uh, lecture, 19.1b, uh, uh, I'm going to work problems on share-based uh, accounting. So that's where maybe it brings it more home to you. Thank you very much.